So, um, yeah, so hello everyone and happy International Women's Day to everyone. I'm delighted to be here with you today on this very special day celebrating women and girls, the achievement of women and girls all over the world. Uh, my name is Gulshan, Gulshan Rahman, and I'm a trustee of the East End Women's Museum. I'm now in my fourth year um, as a trustee, um, having joined in 2019. I've lived and worked, um, as Poonam said, I've lived and worked um, in East London for more than 40 years. I came straight to the London Borough of Newham um, after graduating. Um, and I became a member because I felt it was important that um, women were represented within the, within the uh, Board of Trustees who, who had lived experience of living and working um, in, 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 the, in East London. Uh, thank you for inviting us to speak to you about um, East End Women's Museum today. We are really pleased to have the opportunity to share the history and the future of the museum and some of the stories that have inspired us and continue to inspire, inspire us today. The talk will last approximately 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Uh, please feel free to share your questions, thoughts, and reactions in the chat throughout, uh, throughout the talk. Next slide, please, Poonam. Fighting gender equality. Um, just a, a few, a, a, a few uh, points about my personal background um, and what brought me to uh, be a member of the board. Working towards gender equality has been a passion for me uh, from an early age and throughout my professional career, both working in the charity sector in the UK, working with the South Asian community in East London, and also overseas in international development, working for um, organisation, uh, organisations such as CARE, uh, Save the Children, and having lived in uh, developing countries uh, in Palestine, Bangladesh, and in India. I have a background in public health, and within that, my work is focused on combating sexual and gender-based violence within a sexual and reproductive health framework. Um, more recently, I've moved into um, business development and fundraising, um, but, but doing that within, within, this, within the same sector in terms of women's empowerment and gender equality. I really enjoy being part of East End Women's Movement, East End Women's Museum. Um, it allows me to continue to work towards gender equality, but from a slightly different perspective. Next slide, Poonam, please. So this slide gives us a, 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 an overview of the, how the museum came about. Um, our museum started in very unusual circumstances. It was, it was in the national press at the time. In July 2015, it was revealed that a new museum in Whitechapel, which had been intended to focus on the, on the social history, work and lives of the women of East London, had been hijacked somehow and rebranded as the Jack the Ripper Museum, would you believe it? The, the original plans submitted to the council had gone into detail about all the fantastic women's stories, activism, and lives that would be celebrated. But these were suddenly transformed into a place that focused on the murder and mutilation of women's bodies instead. The museum owners didn't seem to care. The council wasn't able to force the original plans through, and it replicated a long history of women being marginalized and objectified. There were, unsurprisingly, there were immediate protests online and at the site of the museum on Cable Street, which you can see in the photo on the left-hand side. There were protests which brought together local activists, historians, and campaigners. One protester, Sarah, Sarah Hughes, wanted to channel her anger and frustration into something positive. She reached out to an old friend, um, Sarah, who had re researched and written about East London women's history. Sarah wrote, I'm trying to think of something I can do and the most positive thing I can think of is to help create that missing museum 
and help represent all those missing stories myself. I would love to build something physical or otherwise that will keep and share these stories long after this slide sideshow has gone. Her email was to become the first object in our collection. Sarah put a tweet out into the world asking if it was a good idea. 72 hours later, the East End Women's Museum not only had a website and over 800 people offering their support, but also an email from the New York Times asking our opening hours, asking our opening hours, Sarah and Sarah knew they were onto something. So that was, that was our history, that is our history, and that's how we, we came about. Second slide, Poonam, please. So this slide looks at this, the disparity in the recording of history, of, of, of women's history. So, so why was, why was and, and is this so necessary and wanted? Well, there is a distinct lack of women's, his, women's stories in history. In fact, it's estimated by historian Bethany Hughes that women's stories make up just 0.5% of hysterical, historical record. I would urge you to take a moment to think about stories that you learned during your history curriculum or university in, or in school that focused on women, and including the suffragettes. I think, I think the, move, the suffragette movement has, is, has been quite well uh, documented. The facts on the screen demonstrate the extent to which history leaves women out in the UK today. There are more UK statues of men named John than of any mythical non-royal woman. Women make up around 15% of London blue plaques and an estimated 5% of museum art collections. Even on as contemporary a record as Wikipedia, only 17% of biography, biographies are of women. And in a survey by English Heritage in 2016, 40% of respondents stated that women have had less impact on history than men. As well as neg neglecting a wealth of fascinating lives historically, what might this mean for women and girls today? We can see a direct line between the history books and contemporary civic life. If you can't see it, you can't be it. For example, only 8% of FTSE 100 CEOs are women and a third of MPs, albeit the highest rate ever. Currently, it's estimated that it will take 130 years we have, before we have gender parity in the world's head heads of departments, government, heads of government, and 136 years to close the global gender gap. Worryingly, a figure that has increasingly increased substantially in the last two years because of COVID. Clearly, it's essential there are dedicated projects to ensuring women's lives are researched, safeguarded, and shared, which is where we come in. We should be clear that we're far from the only ones, some similarly minded and endeavors include Glasgow Women's Library, the English Heritage on, on blue plaques, Wikipedia's Women in the Red, Red Project, and the Greater London Authority's current work on diversity in the public realm. Next slide, please, Bruno. So the next few slides, uh, we're going to, I'm going to talk you through some of the work, some of the projects that we've done since um, our formation um, to in, in 2015. Next slide, please. So since 2015, we've, using a number of, of, of uh, methodologies and number of activities, we've been able to reach around 20,000 people in person and thousands more online. The museum started out by going out into the communities of East London, to squats, to protests, to pie shops and to markets, to record the stories of women there and put on exhibitions and events. We didn't have, and we still don't have a physical building, but more on that later, when we first started, though that was always our long-term ambition. 
and one that, as you'll see, we are coming to realise. We worked, um, we were working, we worked as a pop-up and virtual museum, working in partnership with museums, archives, community and women's organisations. We undertook projects um, such as capturing vox pops of women shoppers and stallholders at the historic Watney Market in Shadwell. We recreated the headquarters of the East London Federation of Suffragettes, co-founded by Sylvia Pankhurst with Brittell Hamlet's local history library in Bow. We co-produced an exhibition with, with um, Hackney locals looking at women's activism in the borough over the last 10 years. And we interviewed women who worked in factories in Barking and Dagenham between 1930 and 1970 about their struggles for gender and gender and pay equality in the workplace. We also launched three self-guided heritage trails of Whitechapel, Bow, Barking, Hanning Town, and Silvertown, from the first female tube driver to the sugar girls who worked at the sugar factory at uh, Peyton Lyle. Sharing women's stories and artists' responses to them online, including online such as Phyllis Wheatley, the first known published black woman poet in the 18th century, and Dorothy Levitt, a Jewish woman from Hackney, who was one of Britain's first female racing drivers and who apparently invented the rearview mirror. You heard it here first. Next slide, please. Thank you. 2018 was, of course, the centenary of the passing of the Representation of the Peoples Act, the first time some women and all men were able to vote. So that was a big year for us. From 1914 to 1924, the Women's Hall at 400 Old Ford Road in Bow was the headquarters of the East London Federation of Suffragettes and the, and the home of their leader, Syl Sylvia Pankhurst, and her friend, co-suffragette, and amateur photographer, Nora Smythe. The Women's Hall was a radical social center run largely by and for local working class women. And when the First World War caused unemployment and rising uh, food prices, the hall was at the heart of the community's response, housing a cost price restaurant where people could get a hot meal at a very low price and free milk for their children. Working with Tower Hamlet's local history library and archives and the Four Corners Gallery in Bethnal Green, we recreated the Women's Hall alongside a series of talks, workshops, and more, drawing in a wide audience, including the launch event with Helen Pankhurst, the granddaughter of Sylvia Pankhurst. And wonderfully, a guerrilla protest from local mothers about local nursery provision rose up on the day, which you can see in the, in the, in the photo on the, on the bottom right hand side. Next slide, please, Poonam. So this, this slide shows uh, pictures of some of the other activities, uh, projects that we ran uh, in collaboration with Eastside Community, <coughs> excuse me, Community Heritage. Recognizing the, recognizing the significant contribution of women factory workers in Barking and Dagenham in the fight for gender equality in the workplace. The 1968 strike was a famous strike by women sewing machinists at the Ford Motor factory in Dagenham and would go on to inspire the Equal Pay Act of 1970. It was a major milestone in the fight for equal pay and, and has become a symbol of 20th century women's activism, as well as a source of local pride in the borough of Barking and Dagenham and East London more widely. The project included collecting oral histories with women now in their 80s and 90s, who spoke of some all too contem contemporary experiences, including struggling to get personal protective equipment, PPE, uh, in, the, in the factory, sexual harassment, and juggling work and care responsibilities. As well as a pop-up exhibition, we commissioned a local girls' performing arts group to interpret the stories 
as you can see here on the picture on the left hand side. Next slide, please. So the next uh, couple of slides we're going to, I'm going to just talk very briefly about uh, uh, stories about a few women who have inspired us and who continue to inspire the history of, of, of women. Next slide, please. So these are a few wonderful stories of East End women from the past, past five centuries, which we've picked out from our archives to share with you today. There are six here, but um, I won't read all six um, her stories. Um, uh, if, if you'd like to, uh, if you go to our website, you can click on each um, story of, of all these women. Um, so I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about Mary Frith, first of all. Mary Frith was born on Aldgate, Aldersgate Street in 1584 and grew up to be one of the most famous women of her age and of her time, immortalized in not one, but two plays. The Mad Pranks of Mary Mall of the Bankside by John Day in 1610, and The Roaring Girl by Thomas Middleton and Thomas Epper in, 19, in 1611. Mary got her name, called Mall Cut Purse, by stealing purses in the area around St Paul's Cathedral. An accomplice would distract the target while Mary cut the strings of their purse, detaching it from their belt. She became a recognizable figure around town, drinking in taverns, with men smoking a long clay pipe and wearing men's clothing, trousers and a double, some of which you can see in the photo above. It was written at the time that, quote, she could not endure that sedentary life of sewing or stitching. She was a great libertine. She lived too much in common to be enclosed in the limits of a private domestic life. It is difficult to accurately reflect how Mary may have been identified at the time, but it is clear that she stood firm in her gender and sexual identity throughout her lifetime, even to the extent that when she was in the latter days of her life, incarcerated in Bethlehem Hospital and cured of, quote, insanity, unquote, she continued to express herself as she wished. Um, I'm also going to quickly talk about Mary Phyllis. You might not think it judging from period dramas and popular history books, but there has been a black community in Britain since long before the 20th century and the arrival of the Windrush. Mary Phyllis, a young black woman who had come to England from Spain as a child and was working as a servant in Aldgate. The daughter of a Moroccan basket maker, she converted from Islam to Christianity when she was baptized in front of a large congregation in 1597 and later went on to be a skilled dressmaker. Due to the lack of records and particularly with respect to women of color at the time, we can only glimpse a few details about Mary's life here. We can see that she was living as a free woman, a servant and not a slave. In sharp contrast to Mary, we have Olive Christian Mulvery. Mulvery was born in Lahore in the Punjab in 1871. Her parents separated, so she and her brother were raised in India by her maternal grandparents. In, in 1898, Mulvery came to London to study at the Royal College of Music. She supported herself by writing fiction for journals and magazines, giving lectures, teaching elocution, and storytelling inspired by Indian legends. In 1904, Mulvery began work on a photojournalism series on London's poor for Pearson's magazine. She went undercover, disguising herself and working as a flower seller, a barmaid, a factory girl, and a homeless woman, so that she could speak more easily to working class girls and women in East London. In later life, Mulvery continued writing and produced books about child labor and unemployment. Mulvery also paid for two shelters for homeless women to be built in London, inspired by her own experience of sleeping rough. Uh, 
I will cover one more. I will talk about Mary Driscoll in the bottom row, middle bottom row. Mary Driscoll was born to Irish parents in London in 1874. Mary, her sister Mog, and their mother worked for the Bryant and May Match Company in Bow in terrible conditions and for very low pay. Uh, this is the same match, match Bryant and May factory, which still to this day, to this day manufacture matches. In June 88, 1888, when social activist Annie Besant published an article in her weekly newspaper, The Link, about the conditions at Bryant and May, the management tried to get their workforce to sign a paper contradicting the article, which the workers refused to do. One worker was dismissed for failing to sign the paper, triggering a full strike in a single day as around 1,400 women and girls refused to work. The management offered to reinstate the fired employee, but the women then demanded other concessions, particularly in relation to unfair fines, which were deducted from their wages. After a week, the whole factory had stopped work. At a meeting with the management on 16th of July, the match women's terms were accepted and the strike ended in victory. Mary Driscoll was one of the strike leaders and at the time of the strike, she was aged only 14 and living at home with her parents in Poplar. Mary represents the long history of activism and rebellion in the East End particularly in the face of difficult socioeconomic conditions. She was reported to be hardworking, fiercely independent, and typically quiet, but prepared to, quote, fight her corner, unquote. Um, okay, I'm going to leave Annie Newton. So please, uh, Annie Newton was a boxer, fascinating um, uh, story about Annie Newton who, who took up boxing to recover her health. Um, and went on to become um, a, a professional boxer. So please go on to a, go on to our website to find out about Annie Newton and Mary Phyllis. Uh, next slide, Punan, please. So the last section of my presentation, we're going to look at um, our future home, our permanent home in Barking and Dagenham. Next slide, please, Punan. So this is a picture, two, two um, slides of our proposed home in um, Barking. In 2017, uh, we, uh, we began conversations with Barking and Dagenham Council. Aware of the radical history of women's lives and acti activism in the borough, the council had separately had a long-term ambition that there would be a women's museum in the borough. Our founders, um, one of our trustees um, just happened to be a councillor uh, at the time uh, in Barking, and she was able to um, have conversations internally, um, initially thinking, we thought initially that they might, the council might offer us an empty shop somewhere uh, on, on a temporary basis, but instead um, they brought out a blueprint for an entire new building, which had previously been um, a of all things, a comic warehouse. It's quite unusual for a museum building in that, in that it's part of a new residential development. One gallery size space on the ground floor. If you look at the second picture, basically the, um, the museum um, will be in about 50% of the space on the ground floor, um, just behind the, the white car. The premises is located in Barking, uh, town centre just over the road from where Barking was once once home to an abbey, which housed some of the most educated and powerful women in medieval England. In fact, some of the earliest known women writers lived here. And if you go to the to the right of, of, of the building, um, as you to the, to the left of the building, as you're looking at the picture. Uh, you, you, there's a um, river roading, so it's, it's, um, it's a great location. Next slide, please, Brunan. Once we knew that we had a space, our priority was to speak to people about what they wanted to see, do, and feel in a new women's museum. 
So over the past couple of years, we've spoken to over 2,000 2, local residents through a mixture of stalls, community, uh, at community festivals, um, high streets, creative and storytelling workshops, surveys, focus groups, and more. We, have a, we also, during that pro process, um, instituted and recruited to uh, a steering committee. Um, you can see um, top left uh, picture there is a, is a photo of them on a Zoom call. Um, local, these are all locally based volunteers who, in, who provided valuable inputs into um, developing our plans and connected us to diverse communities in the borough. Next slide, please, Pina. So this is a picture of, of some of our um, design teams. We started the formal design process uh, in spring uh, last year, in 2021, bringing on board our architects, project manager, designers, and engineers. We're proud to say that of the nine person consultant team, there's just one token man, which is highly unusual um, for the built, built environment sector. What's more, we are currently exploring how we might be able to bring together an all uh, women trade team to do the fit out of the, the space, including joiners, electricians, and plumbers. We understand that this could be the first all women trades team in the world. The average, sec the average sector average, the average sector average at the moment is just 2%. Next slide, please. So this is a, an architect's design of what the museum will look like. The space is sectioned into three distinct areas. So on the far left uh, is a small room for staff working and quiet space for visitors. The main hall in the middle is where visitors will enter. It incorporates a welcome desk, shop concession, an introductory display on the back wall. Tea point and watch workshop space with um, toilets at the, at the back. And to the right is a gallery space for temporary exhibitions and events. We'll have both permanent and temporary exhibitions featuring a mixture of objects and cases, oral histories, film and interactive technologies. The permanent exhibition will be this introductory story wall that the presenting today, which tells the stories of women as campaigners, carers, sports stars, scientists, rebels, artists, and more. Temporary exhibitions from the Bow Match Girls to the Four Dagenham Strikers today. But as well as, as, as these, given the rich social, cultural, racial history of, of migration to East London, we will be looking at the stories, her stories of recent migrant communities to, to East London, ranging from the French Huguenots to Irish weavers to Ashkenazi Jews to Bangladeshis more recently. Um, where are we now? There will also be opportunities for visitors to share their own stories on site. So we're actively collecting women and girls voices for the future. Next slide, please, Bruno. I'm delighted to share a couple of illustrations by our architects, giving you a flavor of the space once opened. Here you can see the main hall, the entrance um, is on the left, left hand side where the woman with the buggy is coming in with story wall towards the back on the right and the youth workshop taking place at the tables. Next slide, please, Pina. And here is the gallery uh, displaying a temporary exhibition around the outside and with a family activity taking place in the middle. As you can see, we want this to be a relaxed and comfortable experience, which is as hands-on and, and engaging as possible. Thanks, Pina. The last few slides about how um, you can support us. We hope you like, next slide please. 
We hope you like the sound of what we do and, what, and would like to get involved. There are a number of ways that you can do this. Firstly, do follow us on, on social media, on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, where we put out daily stories of inspiring women. We also encourage you to sign up for our e-newsletter. Through all of these channels, you'll be the first to hear about new exhibitions, events and opportunities. Speaking of events, we'd love to see you again, whether in person or online. We put on regular pop-up activities and coffee mornings in Barking, where you can see the site. We also have a range of online talks and debates coming up, including a pop-up space in Barking to, to take part in activities. A woman, a women of Barking walking tour. We've already got one up and running uh, for women of uh, Tower Hamlet's walking tour, uh, which I really recommend. Um, so we're in the process of, of um, pulling together one for Barking and Dagenham. Join local guides on this walking tour to hear about the incredible women of Barking, from the nuns at Barking Abbey to prison reformer, prison reformer Elizabeth Fry, who was buried in Barking. Next slide, please. For those of you who might like to get involved further, we, there are a number of other ways to get involved. Please do consider giving a donation. We are a small charity without core funding, so every penny really does count, and we put it to excellent use. All funding goes directly towards us being able to share more stories of women and to inspire more women and girls. Uh, you might also like to think about joining us as a volunteer. Our volunteers do a range of things, including supporting events and researching, researching, writing up stories for our website. We also have people who offer pro bono advice and support in their professional field, lawyers, architects. We're, we'd be especially keen to hear from you if you have experience delivering capital projects or with developing e-commerce. Uh, and right now we're actually recruiting new trustees to support the charity from a strategic governance perspective. We're particularly looking for people with skills in finance, HR, and safeguarding. If you're interested, please see the new section of our website for further details. We're happy to have a chat before you apply to see if, you, to see if the pick might be a good fit. Next slide, please. Ways to support gender equality. We don't want you to go away feeling deflated, um, but inspired, here are some day-to-day -day ways that you can help promote gender equality. Get involved in gender and diverse, diversity networks, um, whether at your workplace or online. Help to set up one if, if there isn't one. They can help advocate for change and celebrate progress. Make sure you know about your company's diversity, equality and inclusion policy and action plan. Ask what the gender pay gap is and how it's being reduced and who is responsible for this. If you are a parent or have kids in your life, check their curriculum for its gender balance. If women are not well represented, are there ways to address this? We have some learning resources on our website, uh, which, which will help, which can help. Whether you are one or no one, make sure women and girls have the chance to record their stories. You could perhaps record an older relative talking about their life, get younger ones to make a film of their hopes and dreams, or write a regular diary. That way, hopefully women's stories will account for much more than 0.5% in future. Last slide, Pinan, please. Thank you. That's it for the, represent for the presentation. Um, we have a few links here for you to um, follow up in, at your leisure. Thank you very much for listening. I hope um, I haven't overrun. Um, um, I'm happy to take questions um, if there are any. Thank you very much for your time.